group working together to bring us together to worship the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, thousands of Adventist preachers have walked into, or are about to walk into, thousands of Adventist pulpits here in America to address the Seventh-day Adventist community on this Sabbath day, as we do every week. But on this day, being that it's the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attack, we come into this situation under unique circumstances. I can't speak for all of them. I'm sure that there are some churches and some pastors that are choosing not to make reference or they would rather talk about something else, and that's, that's likely that there are some. Most, I'm guessing, are at least acknowledging and making reference and maybe making some form of application but are not making it the focus of the day and the, and the worship and the message. But I would guess, and I have no crystal ball on this or anything, but I would guess that most Adventist churches today are recognizing the uniqueness of the reality that the 20th anniversary just happens to be a Sabbath. Now, I'm the type of person, I don't really believe in coincidences. I don't really want to overly spiritualize things either and try to draw out more than might be appropriate. But I just have to think, is it possible that on this day, God wants his church in America to learn a specific lesson from the events of 9-11? Is it possible? I believe it is possible, as a matter of fact, I believe it's very likely that we as the remnant people in the last days have an opportunity on this Sabbath day to be a people informed and inspired and aware of what the greater implications are of this event. If not us, who? If it's not our job as Seventh-day Adventists, whose job is it to draw people closer to Jesus in understanding what these events have to mean for us in the day in which we live? I take that very seriously. I, I do. When these things align on God's holy day of worship, is there something specific that God wants His people to be thinking about. I can't claim to have the sole understanding of, of exactly all that can be contained and, and uh, conveyed uh, by this uh, day, but I'm going to share with you what I think the Lord has put on my heart. I pray that it will be a blessing to you all. I do have a time of interaction with the young people first. And so I'd love to have their participation if they would raise their hand, and I'd love to have them help out with the kids' quiz. What was the name of the great tower that the people built in Genesis? We actually talked about this last week. I saw your hand go up. Do you want to say it? Say it out loud. The Tower of Babel. What's your name? Diana? Okay. Do you know Leah? The girl you're seeing. Okay, good. <laughs> You are right. Very good. How old are you, Diana? Ten? That's great. Ten years old. Knows the Tower of Babel. Yeah, so that was a, a tower that was uh, in the Old Testament and part of that story. And, of course, after God brought confusion on them, that tower disappears from the pages of history and did not survive, obviously. It is gone. Uh, maybe some foundation stones exist somewhere. We don't know. But uh, the Tower of Babel did not last, did not stand. I also talked about this statue last week. The great statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream did not stand forever. 
What brought it down? And again, I put a hint there, the same thing that brought Goliath down. I did see Toby's hand go up first, so we're going to give him a chance. It was a stone, and I, I like the kind of verbal parallel between the two stories, to think of these great, either the great enemy Goliath being brought down by, you know, a stone, you know, not a great battle with uh, swords and spears and javelins all flaring. Uh, it was just a stone. And in the same way, that statue, not the, the stone, of course, hit Goliath uh, in the head, but the statue, the stone hit the feet, and that one stone uh, demolishes this impressive uh, idol that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about there in Daniel chapter 2. And uh, I think there's some interesting parallels to the two there. Number three, what building was Jesus referring to when he said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. All right, Gio. <laughs> you threw your head up. The temple. Were you going to say that too? No, I mean, uh, uh, I forgot your name. Yeah, didn't you have your hand up? Were you going to say the temple? Okay. <laughs> that is right. It was the temple. So even, even uh, you know, these sacred, wonderful places, this is Herod's temple that Jesus is referring to, uh, was not intended to stand forever. It would one day be torn down and, and part of... Uh, uh, the, the transition of the Jewish nation rejecting the Messiah and, uh, and the establishment of a new temple, a living temple, which is the people of God. So all these great things that do not stand forever. The second angel's message in Revelation 14, 8 says, Fallen, fallen is this the great. And it's referring to a city. Do you remember what that city is that is twice fallen? I'm going to give some of the younger people a chance, but I'll come to you. So I saw Emmett raise his hand. Babylon, that is right. Babylon, that great city there in Daniel chapter 5, uh, or excuse me, Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, you know, this great city of Babylon, I mean, who, who can measure up to it? He, he considered it one of the greatest. And in antiquity, Babylon was known as one of the greatest cities ever built. The walls of Babylon, Herodotus wrote, were some of the most impressive structures ever built. Uh, he claimed that four chariots could ride next to each other at the top of the wall. Um, uh, and yet, fallen, fallen is Babylon. There it comes. All right, last one. We got one more. Fill in the blank, right? Fill in the blank. The blank of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. You know what it is? The blank of the Lord. Owen? That's a good one. That's a good, that's a good one. It's not the power of the Lord. It's not the word we're looking for here. All right? It's not grace. What is it? Uh, this seems like important information, doesn't it? Don't we need to know what it is that we want to run into for, to be safe? And these things aren't wrong. Obviously, grace and God's power is very important. Oh, Chloe, you have your hand up. I'm sorry. What is it? The name. She got it. That's wonderful. The name of the Lord is a strong tower the righteous run into it and is safe. That's going to be a key passage uh, for my message this morning. That's where I get the title, A Strong Tower. And in a way, I'm kind of paralleling this with the story of the Titanic. There are parallels between these two tragedies, the tragedy of the Titanic and the tragedy of September 11th. There's some very powerful parallels, actually. Both of them begin... Uh, uh, the new century uh, with this tragedy that alters forever the psychology and the history and the psyche of the world because of the, those events. So there's, there's some really interesting uh, things that go together with these. You know, when the 20th century began, that's the 1900s, okay, 
When the 20th century began, there was so much optimism in the world. There hadn't been a major world war since Napoleon. The Industrial Revolution and the scientific method and the Enlightenment were advancing technology and industry faster than ever before. There were more jobs in the factories and manufacturing. Uh, mankind had conquered the world at the beginning of the 20th century. That's really what they thought. Disease was being dealt with. Um, poverty was being dealt with. No longer were we contained within the elements of the world. The wind and the waves no longer dictated how fast we could travel across the oceans. We now had engines and steam. Uh, there was already some internal combustion development at this time. At the beginning of the 20th century, it's, it's the end of what um, historians call the modern era, was this idea that mankind had finally succeeded in overcoming the world without God. All right, Without God, Darwinism and the Enlightenment and mysticism had become very much more entrenched in, in, in university and in science and in thought and in education. And even the, uh, the idea, so there's also a tie-in. The Titanic is kind of also a symbol of, of, of uh, the Tower of Babel. It was kind of also like the opening salvo of, of, of humanism at the beginning of the 20th century. And, and you know the story. It's a rumor. I'm not an expert on the Titanic, by the way. Maybe some of you know more about this than I do. But my understanding is it's a rumor that the captain of the Titanic bragged that the ship was unsinkable, that even God himself could not. That was the quote. God himself could not sink this ship. That was a rumor. I, I'm not sure if that's ever been verified, but it's obviously a very widespread idea. So really the Titanic was kind of uh, mankind's saying, we, we've done it. We have done it. And when, now keep in mind, this is another one of the parallels between Titanic and, and the Twin Towers. Um, um, when the Titanic, I just lost my train of thought there, George. You're going to have to keep me on track here. When the Titanic was built, it was a, a symbol really of man's highest achievement. Okay? And when it sank, now again, there had been many ocean liners that had sank. I mean, traveling the high seas, it wasn't unusual for ships to sink. It was always a hazardous thing to travel across the Atlantic. These things happened all the time. What made the Titanic different was the symbolism. It was the symbolism of man's achievement and man's dominance of the world. And when the Titanic sunk, it changed, uh, historians and sociologists agree, it changed the, the psyche of the world. The world changed when the Titanic sunk. Just two years later, our world, that we begin the 20th century, all this optimism about conquering uh, disease and conquering homelessness and poverty and, and, and uh, engineering and everything advancing so fast, just two years after the Titanic sinks, World War I begins. And the world is plunged into some of the worst tragedy that's ever happened. And then 20 years after World War I ends, World War II happens. So by the middle of the 20th century, all of the optimism, all of the ideas of modernism have sunk and gone down and, and been eliminated. And then we begin postmodernism that is filled with skepticism, cynicism, and, and things like that. And so the idea with the Twin Towers is the same thing. When the Twin Towers are attacked... At the beginning of, of the 21st century, again, it, it was, there had been lots of terrorist attacks before. There was Oklahoma City. The Twin Towers themselves were attacked in 1993 with the bomb that they, uh, someone did. They tried to knock over the towers with a bomb. There had been uh, planes that people had been taken hostages on uh, quite frequently in the 70s and early 80s. That was happening. So the idea that this country experienced terrorism was not new, but it was highly symbolic. It changed forever the psyche of our world when September 11th happened in a similar way that when the Titanic sank. You with me on that? Okay. We are a different people because of this. There is more fear than there's ever been before. There's more, been more division, more disunity. I, I heard someone recently say this week, you know, right after 9-11, uh, there, there was a momentary time of clarity and unity for our country. We kind of knew there was an enemy. We, knew, we found out who that enemy was, and we united as a country. We went after the, the enemy, and we began the process, and the war on terror begins. But that lasted a very short time. How many of you remember... What the U.S. senators, the, the 100 U.S. senators did the next day on September 12th. Do any of you remember what they did? Wow. Maybe when I say it, you'll remember it. 
all 100 U.S. senators went on the steps of the U.S. Capitol and they sang God Bless America. Do you remember that now? It was, it was hokey and off-key, and it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty rugged, but, but it was highly symbolic. They, the 100 U.S. senators, now remember, this is just a few years after the hanging Chad Florida, you know, is, is Gore or Bush, you know, Supreme Court, all that. We were pretty divided, right? But 100 U.S. senators went on the steps of the Capitol, and they sang, of all things, they sang, God bless America. Well, do you think that would happen today? What would it take? What would it take to, to make that? I, I don't. I can't think of anything now. Again, I've, I'm that, maybe that's somewhat cynical and pessimistic of me. But do you think anything like that could happen today? Oh, it would have to be pretty dramatic. It'd have to be more, uh, pretty significant beyond uh, probably even that. When the Titanic sunk, the next Sunday um, in Belfast, Ireland. The ship was built in Belfast, most of it was at least, and many uh, local people were involved in its construction. And kind of as a reward and a, uh, 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 a benefit, many of those local workers were invited to ride on the Titanic on its maiden voyage. So when it sank and all those people died, the, the city of Belfast was really devastated. And, and there's stories of, of, at that time, grown men uh, who didn't know each other just meeting in the street and embracing and crying and, 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 and then partying and going their other ways. Uh, it's just devastating. And uh, there's a story of an American preacher who'd been invited to preach in a church in Belfast. Um, can you imagine being the guest speaker on a day like that? Um, where 16, 16 uh, of the men uh, that were members of that church had died. And he's looking out on this congregation filled with brand new widows, you know, brand new orphans, and he chose as his title, The Unsinkable Ship. And on first glance, it's like, oh, he's going to rub it in. Man, that's rough. But he didn't talk about the Titanic, really. He talked about the ship that Jesus was in, that was caught in a storm. And everyone thought that they were going to die, but Jesus was with them, and so they survived. And that was the unsink uh, excuse me, unsinkable ship. Well, that's kind of a, a similar analogy I'm, I'm wanting to make with a strong tower as the title of my sermon. The World Trade Center was a symbol of worldwide economy. I had no previous, uh, you know, emotional ties with New York or that. It was obviously part of the skyline, well-known uh, uh, buildings there in New York. There, I, I like this picture with the um, Statue of Liberty uh, there as well. And uh, I remember I was watching TV live uh, after the first tower had been hit, and of course all the cameras were watching it. Everyone's trying to figure out. And I actually was watching live when the second plane hit. Um, I was working at Costco at the time, and uh, everyone was gathered in the break room. Uh, even the bosses, this is very unusual. At Costco, you don't really get to stop very often. They have a saying there, make a move or make a mess, but do something. Um, but at uh, even the bosses, of course, uh, gathered as we were watching that event uh, take place. And again, there'd been terrorism before, but this was different. This was, this was something that changed our country and changed our world. Um, point out a couple of things. This is about five days after, and you can still see the smoke and the ash that was rising. I, I guess it was actually for weeks just hanging in the air. Um, a lot of people got very sick just from the ash. Now, you can't see it in this picture, but right in the middle, right where that laser pointer is, there's a tiny little grove of trees. And in that grove of trees, or by that grove of trees, is a church. That's the St. Paul Church. Here's another picture of it. There's a, this is when the Twin Towers were being built, so this is an older. It shows you how close it was, and here is an aerial photo photograph. Obviously, here's where the towers were, and right there, it's really considered in the back. It, it was called in the backyard of that church was where the Twin Towers were. That church was unaffected. It was unaffected by the collapse and the attacks of those towers. Almost every other building sustained at least some, if not substantial damage, but St. Paul's Church survived. 
St. Paul's Church was built in 1766. It's the oldest church in New York and one of the oldest buildings in Manhattan, period. It was in this church where George Washington, shortly after being inaugurated for president, went and prayed. There's actually a pew in that church, they call it George Washington's pew, where he went when he was inaugurated to be the first president, where he went and he prayed to God. It was in this church that James Monroe's funeral service was held. It was in this church that Lafayette came and worshipped and listened to choirs sing uh, when the French helped uh, during the American Revolution. This is a pretty historic building, and it survived. It stood. How many of you remember this? The Ground Zero Cross. Now, there's an element of this where um, in that amount of chaos and carnage, you're going to find all sorts of shapes, and you can twist and turn things to make it look like almost like, you know, uh, 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 where you do cloud pictures. Oh, I see a turtle. I see a, a, din a dinosaur. So uh, there's an element of this. You say, you know, they can find whatever they want. But when you look at that, it was standing erect. This is how it was found. It was standing erect. It was a prefabricated piece of steel. You can see the, uh, the cut marks on each side. That's a piece of um, insulation. That, I guess it's fiberglass. That, it, that intense heat kind of caused it to melt and coalesce around it. But I just want you to notice this. That, they, they, they removed it. They, they preserved it. It's part of the, the memorial, I guess, um, as, as part of the, uh, the Ground Zero Memorial. That's a pretty perfectly shit. This has not been manipulated. Isn't that pretty perfect? Now you can, again, you can say, ah, it's just an accident. You can find any shape. But when you look at it, even the bit of insulation that's wrapped around it, it, it looks kind of like the shroud that you sometimes see decorating a cross, representing, you know, the, uh, the shroud that Jesus wore before he was crucified. And of course, workers and, and people, this became an incredibly powerful symbol for people that were workers, people looking for survivors, uh, people, they, they made a, a, you know, a memorial, and they've, they've signed it, and they've written things all over it, and uh, again, it's been preserved as part of the 9-11 memorial, and I just look at these two things, and I just say, was God there? Was God aware and participating and, and providing hope during this time? The preservation of St. Paul's Church the discovery, this, it was like on the 10th day, too, that they found that cross. It wasn't like day one. 10th day, they find it. I, I see in those, in, in the amount of hope and, and, and uh, opportunity for people to see a silver lining in the preservation of those, I find to be quite powerful. Again, we read from Proverbs 18.10 during the, the kids' quiz. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. You know, this is actually a big theme in the Bible. It's not just a verse here or there. This idea of God being our refuge, God being our tower, God being our stronghold. This is from 2 Samuel. Um, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. He's my deliverer. He is a tower of deliverance to his king. He shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Now, there's two ways of looking at this word tower in the Bible. One of them is, yes, the physical, literal tower that was built. When they were early city builders back then, if you wanted to have any success from avoiding the, the, the marauding raiders that would come through to steal your children for slavery or try to kill you to take your possessions, you had to have a strong tower that you could run into. It was a physical building. You would build a tower, all right, and it would be just enough for your village or your, your, your group or your tribe, all right, and when the marauders come, you'd all run into that tower and, and they would hit it with their sticks and swords and maybe shoot arrows at it, but you would be safe in that tower and you could even drop rocks on, you know, and, and shoo them away. So there is a literal application, but a lot of times the Bible writers are also reflecting back to the Tower of Babel when they compare God to being a strong tower. They're saying... The tower that man builds is fragile. The tower that man builds is going to fail. But the tower that is the Lord will stand forever. And in that we have safety. So I think that that is also an application. He is a tower of deliverance to his king. Shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants. How long? I want to see if you're listening. Thank you. Paying attention. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, forever. Again, this is a theme throughout the Bible. For you have been a refuge to me. 
a tower of strength against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. This is a community and a people who are accustomed to being attacked all the time. Right? I mean, you even read in, in the Old Testament what it just says uh, in the story of David and Bathsheba. It says, and the time came when the kings went to war. Right? It just is mentioned nonchalantly. It's just kind of said, oh, you know how we're always fighting? Well, this is when that time came. Right? There was always terrorism. There was always raiders. There were always thieves. There were always murderers out there trying to get you. And they all and the Bible writers living in that time and the prophets who wrote identify how God is that refuge in that very chaotic world and time. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your rings. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. I like the determination of that verse. I shall not be shaken. The Lord, my rock, my salvation. Psalm 91, 2. This is from the, the, that great Psalm 91. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then we come to the main text that I took the sermon title from. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Can we say that verse together? Let's everyone just say this. We don't do this very often. We're going to do some corporate uh, 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 worship together here. Let's say it together. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Okay, that's pathetic. We're going to do it again. Say it with some life now. I want to hear you. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. What does that mean? It seems important to know if that's where our safety is found. What does it mean, the name of the Lord? You can see I've, I've, I've highlighted there. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Really, there's only two names uh, for God. There's a lot of titles. There's a lot of honorifics. There's a lot of identifiers for God and symbols, but really there's only two names, okay? When Moses in the, in the uh, burning bush uh, asks God his name, he says, I am. I am that I am. You tell them that the I am has sent you. He who ever lives, he's ever-present help in time of trouble. The I am. All those other names are great. The El Shaddai, God Almighty, uh, you know, Jehovah Jireh and, uh, uh, you know, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Those are fine. We can analyze them. They're certainly part of it. But really, the I am is what is being referred to. The name of the Lord. Yahweh. Yahweh. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. He is the living, ever-present God. He never was and he never will be. He is. That's his name. I'm with you today. G the Lord Jesus uh, was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He says in Malachi, I am the Lord God. I change not. Therefore, you are saved, Jacob. He is God. He is the one who created you. He's your Redeemer. He's your Lord. He's your King. He is those things. He never was. He never will be. He is. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. When you know his name, when you accept that he is your God, not that he was your God, not that he one day will be your God, but that he is your God, that is your security, that is your safety, that is your faith, that is what you run into. Despite what happens, he is my God. I don't know what's going to happen with vaccine mandates. You may like them, you may love them, you may want them, you may be discouraged that people are resistant to it. You may hate vaccine mandates. You may be fearful for your job. You may be wondering what the future holds. But you can run into the name of Jesus Christ. He is still God. The other name is Jesus. That is his name given in the New Testament. You shall call him Jesus, for he will save people from his sins. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. We can take hope. We can take faith. We can take trust in his name. He is the same Jesus today that he was 2,000 years ago. He is the same I am today that he was 3,500 years ago when Moses met him at the burning bush. 
He is the same God. He has not forgotten about us. He has not left us. He has not abandoned us. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Now this next part here is is very telling to me too. The righteous runs. Now any of you who know anything about Hebrew culture and Israeli culture, they do not run. They do not run. The idea of running for recreation or running, running is a symbol of fear. Running is a symbol of being in a hurry. Running is not sacred. This is, you know, kind of the uh, uh, cultural way of looking at it. This is why when Zacchaeus ran, it was a big deal. This is why when the father in the prodigal son story runs to meet his son is a big deal. Because Jewish men do not run. Even today, it's not a popular common thing for a traditional conservative Jew to run. But here in this passage, Solomon tells us in Proverbs 18, the righteous throw those considerations aside. And when you know who God is, when you know you need a stronghold, you do not waltz into that stronghold. You do not amble, all right? You don't lollygag. You run. You run. When Lot was being encouraged to come out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he delayed so much that the angels had to literally grab him by the arm. And because of that, he destruction was at his heels as, as the angels were pulling him out. That should not be our story. We should run to Jesus. There should be no other priority in our life when we're facing these challenges. He is the God of the universe. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runs. It's not, I'll take that as my second or third option if these other options don't work out. I'll give the Lord a try. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Now you notice that the, uh, what do you call it? The is there is singular, right? If it was the corporate righteous, if it said, if it was we all as righteous people run, it would say, and are safe, right? I, is there an English teacher in the house? Am I getting that right? All right, this is singular. What does that tell you? You have to make that decision. It's not enough to say, oh, well, my church is running. That's good. Oh, my people, yeah, my denomination is running, yeah, my family, they're doing it, and I'm part of that. No, this is a personal decision we all have to make. The righteous individual, the righteous person, the righteous one. And by the way, is it the, right, is it the running that makes them righteous, or are they righteous because they run? <laughs> Do I need to say that again? Was that too fast? Daniel, are you with me on that one? What makes them righteous? The fact that they're running? Or are they running because they're righteous? Where is our righteousness found? It's found in Christ. You're not running because you're righteous. You're righteous because you're running to Jesus. You with me on that? That's what makes us righteous. If we were righteous already, we wouldn't need to run to him. What, what, we'd be able to say, God, you've got nothing against me. I don't need to run anywhere. I'm righteous. Right? No, it's the, I, by the very admission that we need him and that we're running to him that God looks upon and says, all oh, your righteousness is filthy rags, but this act brings you closer to me and my grace is sufficient. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. This last part is the hardest part. What do you mean is safe? Didn't people die on September 11th? Were they safe? Didn't didn't the Titanic sink? Thousands perished? Uh, I know people that have run to the Lord and they still experience pain and heartache, trials, suffering, disease, 
and death? What, what is this? What is the safety that God is promising us? Is it safety in this life? Is it a promise from God that if you run to him, that if you take his name and you make him your strong tower, that he will save you from every possible evil and ill that this world throws at us? Is that what it means? Do you find that teaching anywhere in the Bible? No. As a good Bible student, we look at that and we say, that's not what it means. Jesus himself suffered great persecution. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But it's the second part. But take heart. I have overcome this world. You make me your stronghold. You make me your trust. You make me your God, your ever-present help in a time of trouble. And I will, in the end, in the last day, at the time of resurrection, make all things right. And you will be part of that resurrected or that transformed and translated group who gets to experience eternal life. Not because you earned it or deserve it, but because you ran to me in your time of need. There is a tower that will stand forever. That cross will always stand. The cross that is the symbol of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ will never be torn down. The reality of what Jesus has done for us will be etched into the universe forever. It will constantly be a reminder and a symbol of the cost of our salvation and of the love of God for every single person. The cross is a strong tower. And His church, Jesus told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The, uh, Mrs. White says, as feeble and defective as it may appear to be, the church is the object on earth which is still of God's supreme regard. Not the physical structure, but the reality of what we are as a people stands and can never be torn down. It can never be torn down. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what trials you're facing. I don't know what pressures, conflicts, confusion. We are in a very interesting time. I think that's a fair way of saying it. A time unlike anything we've seen. Will you make the Lord your strong tower? Will you run? Father, this is a day of sadness. It's also a day of celebrating heroes, honoring victims, reflecting on the events of our world. God, it's also a day of reflecting on the world that you are still developing and remembering that you have never abandoned us. Your cross still stands. Your church still stands. Your name has not changed. And Lord, we want to be a people united in You, drawn to You through a knowledge of what You've done for our salvation. A people who are not shy in their faith. A people willing to throw aside customs and expectations and run. Help us to run to You, Father. Help us to make your salvation a priority, not just for ourselves, but that we can be beacons and ambassadors in this world for others. Thank you that we're part of this church, Lord. Thank you that we can remember and we can learn. Keep giving us wisdom. Bless us, Father. We love you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. I hope you can join us for potluck. If not, we'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you.